Hey everybody, this is Vertebrates Part 2. So here we go. Now, we're going to talk about reptiles for just a few minutes. Reptiles, um, that includes, of course, alligators, crocodiles, um, snakes, lizards, turtles, and then also birds and dinosaurs, which we know as, of as extinct. Okay, There are some uh, mammal-like reptiles, and there's evidence that birds are actually considered to be like living dinosaurs, and um, their bone structure actually makes it to where um, scientists think that they may have descended like from pterodactyls, okay, those dinosaurs that flew. Um, reptiles, getting back to this, um, their body tends to be covered with scales to protect against desiccation or drying out, and also against predators, okay, and they have very well-developed sense organs. Um, snakes actually have a tongue that's modified to help them smell, actually. Now, reptiles reptiles they have well-developed lungs they do have a rib cage negative pressure breathing what that means is that when their rib cage expands a partial vacuum is established and negative pressure causes air to rush into the lungs okay so it just helps them breathe some reptiles have a three-chambered heart and the atrium of the heart is um, always separated into right and left chambers, but division of the ventricle, that can vary. Okay? It can be incomplete. And an interventricular septum that divides the ventricles is incomplete in certain species of reptiles. And so in some reptiles, you get the mixing of blood, um, the deoxygenated and the oxygenated, kind of like the amphibians have. There are also some reptiles like alligators and crocodiles. They actually have a four-chambered heart so you know. Um, reptiles, uh, a lot of them are able to reproduce on land. They have an amniotic egg that provides lots of nutrients. And um, fish, amphibians, and reptiles are all ectothermic. And that's a good term to know. Ectothermic means that their body temperature matches the temperature of the external environment. So basically they are cold-blooded. So if it's um, really, really cold outside, they are cold on their insides. And if it's very, very hot outside, then they are warm on their insides also. Okay. Now, some snakes lay eggs and other snakes give birth to live young. And there are different species of snakes. Okay. And the snakes that lay eggs, they lay amniotic eggs. And basically that made development on land possible. And it eliminated the need for having like larvae that swim during development. Okay. And the egg for these snakes provides an embryo with oxygen, food, water. It helps remove uh, nitrogenous waste. It protects the embryo, embryo from drying out, okay, things like that. And so you can look in here. And reptiles other than snakes, you know, obviously are going to lay some eggs also. And like turtles, okay, um, turtles and, you know, birds and things like that. But they have... Um, protein albumin okay they've got a chorion which provides you know a nice sheltering environment okay and um, basically the growing embryo has got everything it needs now feathered reptiles are birds and they have um, scales on their feet and they have a hard shell uh, hard-shelled eggs. Uh, most of them can fly with the exception of like ostriches and emus and penguins, right? things like that. Dodo birds didn't fly. They're extinct though. And they're traditionally classified based on their beak and also on their foot type. Okay? And they're also classified somewhat on their habitat and then their behavior. Okay? And there are about 9,000 species of bird. Now, feathered reptiles were birds. Basically everything of a bird's anatomy relates to its ability to fly. Okay. So you know even birds that don't fly have kind of modified wings okay, like penguins do and that helps them kind of steer or helps them kind of have their balance. Okay. 
The forelimbs are modified as wings. They have hollow bones that have air cavities to help them be able to fly better. They have beaks that have replaced their jaws. They have large sternum that a lot of muscles attach to. They have air sacs to have more efficient breathing. Okay. And basically the air circulates one way through the lungs and gases are continuously exchanged across respiratory uh, tissues. Okay. And basically um, they're made to fly. Okay. And they have you know, endothermic kind of body system. Endothermic means that their internal temperature is constant because they generate and maintain their metabolic heat. So endothermic, um, that's birds and that's also humans. Okay, Mammals are really endothermic and that just means that they're warm-blooded. Okay, So if it's very, very hot outside, then, ant then birds and Mammals are going to be uh, warm on their insides, but if it's really, really cold outside, birds and mammals are also still going to be warm on their insides. Okay, so if it's really cold outside, they're still going to be, you know, warm-blooded, okay, or have a constant internal body temperature. They have acute sense organs and a very well-developed brain. A lot of birds are really bright. You can teach them how to talk. Um, you can t train them. Okay, to do different things like um, fly, you know, from your arm and then come back and land on your arm, things like that. Okay, but they're considered to be, you know, pretty smart as far as a lot of animals go. Now, here's the internal, you know, innards of a bird right here. You don't have to know details, but just know it's got a trachea, it's got lungs, it's got a lot of the same things that we have. Okay. Um, the gizzards are just part of their, you know, digestive tract. Okay, the pancreas, things like that. And here's what their um, internal lungs look like. Okay, and basically they have air sacs that, you know, you have constant gas exchange that goes across. Okay, and so basically the inhaled air goes in and the exhaled goes out. Now, just a little review here. Um, fish have a two-chambered heart, one atrium, one ventricle, and just kind of a loop around. And the blue represents oxygen-poor blood. The red represents oxygen-rich blood. And actually, it's going this way, sorry. Um, so it's going around and around like this. Amphibians and most reptiles, like the smaller reptiles, tend to have a three-chambered heart. They have two atriums and one ventricle, and their blood does mix. So you, just like the fish, you get deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood that's kind of mixing. And then birds, crocodiles, um, alligators, and then mammals, they have a four-chambered heart. So their blood uh, that's deoxygenated and oxygenated does not mix at all. Okay, and that just provides better circulation for you know birds and then alligators, crocodiles, and then mammals. Okay, and that helps a lot because we don't breathe through our skin nearly as much as like amphibians and some reptiles. The lower reptiles are the smaller ones. Now, mammals. Mammals, um, their chief characteristic, they have body hair, or we have body hair, and then also mammary glands that make milk. And there are about 4,600 species of mammals, and they think that mammals actually evolved from reptiles also. And uh, mammals are endothermic. They maintain a constant internal temperature. Um, there is a high level of care for the young. Um, mammals tend to nurse. Okay, They give their... Um, offspring milk. The young tend to be born alive. Um, the females tend, or the males, tend to shelter the young and provide, you know, care for sometimes weeks or months after the little one is born, okay, while the little one's maturing. And there's also a, a big bond between the mother and the offspring as well. Okay. And hair is real important because it provides insulation against heat loss. It allows animals to be active even in cold weather. Um, and then mammals also have efficient respiratory and circulatory systems, and that provides a steady stream of oxygen to the muscles. Um, and those contractions of the muscles produce a lot of body heat. Okay. They have a four-chambered heart with double-loop circulation. Okay. And 
Mammals are classified either as monotremes, marsupials, or placentals. So let's take a look at these one by one. Now monotremes, really that just makes up the spiny anteater and the duck-billed platypus. Okay, so there are four species of spiny anteaters and one species of duck-billed platypus. Okay, now the males and the females have modified sweat glands and they secrete milk and the babies actually lick that up. Sounds kind of strange. Um, the duck-billed platypus lays eggs in a burrow and the mother will incubate the eggs and after they hatch, they actually will, you know, lick up the, on the modified sweat glands. Okay. And then the spotty anteater, it has eggs that basically move from a cloaca to the pouch. And the spiny anteater, um, the babies will stay in the burrow, and the mother will kind of visit and nurse them sort of periodically. Okay. So she sticks around for a little while. A cloaca, just so you know, in a monotreme, that's a terminal region of the digestive tract that serves as a kind of common chamber for waste and also sex cells. Okay, just so you know. Okay, so the monotremes, that's the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteater. And they, are, of course, are found all in Australia. Kind of isolated there. Now, marsupials. Marsupials, that's possums and also kangaroos, uh, koala bears, Tasmanian devils. The Virginia possum is the only marsupial species that is north of Mexico, and marsupials are found mostly in Australia, and their young are born very immature, um, usually they're just about an inch long or so, and development is completed within a pouch. Okay, So kangaroos, here we have a joey or a baby kangaroo that's almost fully grown, Okay, as far as, you know, a little joey goes. But um, when they're first born, kangaroos, they're very, very tiny. And um, marsupials provide a much higher level of care than monotremes do to their young. Okay. And here's some examples right here. The duckbill platypus is a monotreme, and then the possum and the koala, those are marsupials. Okay. Now, placental mammals, we fit in there, and basically we have um, a lot of internal development. The gestation period tends to be much longer, of course, for humans and elephants. Okay. Um, we are very adapted for active life on land. We have limbs that allow for you know running and jumping and climbing. Um, our lungs are expanded by a rib cage and a diaphragm. The diaphragm is just a horizontal muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Um, we have a four-chambered heart and an internal body temperature. We're endothermic. We have hair over most of our body, and we have a well-developed brain with cerebral hemispheres. Okay, and Basically, we also have a chorion, and the chorion is going to contribute to the fetal portion of a placenta, okay, while a part of the uterine wall is going to contribute to kind of the maternal portion of the placenta. And basically, between the mother and the offspring, um, nutrients, oxygen, waste are going to be exchanged between fetal and maternal blood, okay, so the chorion really contributes a lot to that. Now, placental mammals, they are differentiated teeth based on what they eat, okay, and how big they are. And classifying these placental mammals is based on how they get food and how they move. Basically, whether they fly or run or swim, things like that. Here's some examples of placental mammals right here. Okay, these killer whales are actually considered you know, to be mammals, not not fish, just so you know. Now, primates. Um, primates are considered to be kind of higher mammals. They say that um, the human DNA is 98% identical to chimpanzee DNA. Okay, it's kind of weird to think about. Most of them live in trees. They have very mobile limbs. They're very flexible. They have hands and feet that they can use for lots of different things, like grasping, um, for helping them swing through the trees. They have eyes, obviously, in the front of their head. Okay, um, They have a large, complex brain to help them feel emotions 
and be able to have um, complex social relationships. They generally give birth to one offspring at a time, and there's a definite period of juvenile dependency where um, particularly the mother and the child spend a lot of time together and you know she teaches them how, different things like how to hunt, how to gather food, um, how to get along with the other you know primates, things like that. And um, let's see, basically they have very good depth perception. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on learned behavior. Okay, and um, basically, they tend to teach there's lots of different things.